chapter 4, part 2. Remember, this one is called The Witch's Headstone. A flash of pain woke him, sharp as ice, the color of snow thunder, of slow thunder, down in the weeds that summer night. The ground beneath him seemed relatively soft and oddly warm. He pushed a hand down and felt something like warm fur beneath him. He had landed on the grass pile where the graveyard's groundskeeper threw the cuttings from the mower, and it had broken his fall. Still, there was pain in his chest, and his leg hurt as if he had landed on it first and twisted it. Bod moaned, "'Hush a you, hush a boy,' said a voice from behind him. "'Where did you come from, dropping like a thunderstone? What way is that to carry on?' "'I was in the apple tree,' said Bod. "'Ah, let me see your leg. "'Broken like the tree's limb, I'll be bound.' "'Cool fingers prodded his left leg. "'Not broken. Twisted, yes. Sprained, perhaps. "'You'll have the devil's own luck, boy, falling into the compost. "'Taint the end of the world.' "'Oh, good,' said Bod. "'Hurts, though.' "'He turned his head, looked up and behind him. She was older than him, but not a grown-up, and she looked neither friendly nor unfriendly, wary, mostly. She had a face that was intelligent and not even a little bit beautiful. "'I'm Bod,' he said. "'The live boy?' she asked. Bod nodded. "'I thought you must be,' she said. "'We've heard of you even over here in the potter's field. What do they call you?' "'Owens,' he said. "'Nobody Owens. Bod, for short.' Bod looked, um, how de do young Master Bod? Bod looked her up and down. She wore a plain white shift. Her hair was mousy and long, and there was something of the goblin in her face, a sideways hint of a smile that seemed to linger, no matter what the rest of her face was doing. Were you a suicide? he asked. Did you steal a shilling? "'Never stole nothing,' she said. "'Not even a handkerchief. "'Anyway,' she said pertly, "'the suicides is all over there on the other side of that hawthorn, "'and the gallows birds are all in the blackberry patch, both of them. "'One was a coiner, t'other a highwayman, or so he says, "'although if you ask me, I doubt he was more than a common footpad and nightwalker.' "'Ah,' said Bod, then, suspicion forming tentatively, he said, "'They say... A witch is buried here, she nodded. Drowned and burned it and buried here without as much as a stone to mark the spot. You were drowned and burned? She settled down on the hill of grass cuttings beside him and held his throbbing leg with her chilly hands. They come to my little cottage at dawn before I'm proper awake and drags me out into the green. You're a witch, they shouts, fat and fresh scrubbed, all pink in the morning, like so many pigwiggins, scrubbed clean for market day. One by one they gets up beneath the sky and tells of milk gone sour and horses gone lame. And finally, Mistress Jemima gets up, the fattest, pinkest, best scrubbed of them all, and tells how, as Solomon Porret now cuts her dead, and instead hangs around at the wash house like a wasp about a honey pot. And it's all my magic, she says, that made him so, and the poor young man must be bespelled. So they strap me to the cucking stool and forces it under the water of the duck pond, saying, If I'm a witch, I'll ni- neither drown nor care, but if I'm not a witch, I'll feel it. And Mistress Jemima's father gives them each a silver groat to hold the stool down under the foul green water for a long time to see if I'd choke on it. And did you? Oh, yes, got a lungful of water. It done for me. Oh, said Bod. Then you weren't a witch after all? The girl fixed him with her beady ghost eyes and smiled a lopsided smile. She still looked like a goblin, but now she looked like a pretty goblin, and Bod didn't think she would have needed magic to attract Solomon Porritt, not with a smile like that. What nonsense! Of course I was a witch! They learned that when they untied me from the cucking stool and stretched me out on the green, nine parts dead and all covered with duckweed and stinking pond muck. I rolled my eyes back in my head, and I cursed— each and every one of them there on the village green that morning, that none of them would ever rest easily in a grave. 
I was surprised at how easily it came, the cursing, like dancing it was, when your feet pick up the steps of a new measure your ears have never heard and you'd, your head don't know, and they dance it till dawn. She stood and twirled and kicked, and her bare feet flashed in the moonlight. That was how I cursed them, with my last gurgling, pond-watery breath. And then I expired, and they burned my body on the green until I was nothing but blackened charcoal, and they popped me in a hole in the potter's field without so much as a headstone to mark my name. And it was only then that she paused and seemed for a moment wistful. "'Are any of them buried in the graveyard, then?' asked Bod. "'Not a one,' said the girl, with a twinkle. "'The Saturday after they drowned and toasted me, "'a carpet was delivered to Master Porringer, "'all the way from London town, "'and it was a fine carpet, "'but it turned out there was more in that carpet "'than strong wool and good weaving, "'for it carried the plague in its pattern, "'and by Monday five of them were coughing blood "'and their skins were gone as black as mine "'when they hauled me from the fire.' A week later, and it had taken most of the village, and they threw the bodies, all promiscuous, in the plague pit they dug outside of town, that they filled in after. Was everyone in the village killed? She shrugged. Everyone who watched me get drowned and burned. How's your leg now? Better, he said. Thanks. Bod stood up, slowly, and limped down from the grass pile. He leaned against the iron railings. So... "'Were you always a witch?' he asked. "'I mean, before you cursed them all?' "'As if it would take witchcraft,' she said with a sniff, "'to get Solomon Porrett mooning around my cottage.' "'Which, Bod thought, but did not say, "'was not actually an answer to the question. "'Not at all. "'What's your name?' he asked. "'Got no headstone,' she said, "'turning down the corners of her mouth. "'Might be anybody, mightn't I? "'But you must have a name.' "'Liza Hempstock, if you please,' she said tartly. Then she said, "'It's not that much to ask, is it? "'Something to mark my grave? "'I'm just down there, see, "'with nothing but nettles to show where I rest.' And she looked so sad, just for a moment, that Bod wanted to hug her, and then it came to him, as he squeezed between the railings of the fence, he would find Liza Hempstock a headstone with her name upon it. He would make her smile.' He turned to wave goodbye as he began to clamber up the hill, but she was already gone. There were broken lumps of other people's stones and statues in the graveyard, but, Bod knew, that would have been entirely the wrong sort of thing to bring to the grey-eyed witch in the potter's field. It was going to take more than that. He decided not to tell anyone what he was planning on the not entirely unreasonable basis that they would have told him not to do it. Over the next few days, his mind filled with plans, each more complicated and extravagant than the last. Mr. Pennyworth despaired. "'I do believe,' he announced, scratching his dusty moustache, "'that you are getting, if anything, worse. "'You are not fading. "'You are obvious, boy. "'You are difficult to miss. "'If you came to me in the company with a purple lion, "'a green elephant, and a scarlet unicorn "'astride which was the King of England in his royal robes, "'I do believe that it is you and you alone "'that people would stare at, "'dismissing the other, others as minor irrelevancies.' "'Bod simply stared at him and said nothing. "'He was wondering whether there were special shops "'in the places where the living people gathered "'that sold only headstones, "'and if so, how he could go about finding one, "'and fading was the least of his problems. "'He took advantage of Miss Borrow's willingness "'to be diverted from the subjects of grammar and composition "'to the subjects of anything else at all "'to ask her about money, "'how exactly it worked, "'how one used it to get things one wanted, "'bought out a number of coins he had found over the years,' He had learned that the best place to find money was to go, afterwards, to wherever courting couples had used the grass of the graveyard as a place to cuddle and snuggle and kiss and roll about. He would often find metal coins on the ground in the place where they had been, and he thought perhaps he could finally get some use from them. "'How much would a headstone be?' he asked Miss Boros. "'In my time,' she told him, "'they were fifteen guineas.' I do not know what they would be today. More, I imagine. Much, much more. 
Bod had two pounds and fifty-three pence. It would, he was quite certain, not be enough. It had been four years, almost half a lifetime, since Bod had visited the indigo man's tomb, but he still remembered the way. He climbed to the top of the hill until he was above the whole town, above even the top of the apple tree, above even the steeple of the little chapel, up where the Frobisher mausoleum stood like a rotten tooth. He slipped down into it, behind the coffin, and down and down, and still further down, down to the tiny stone steps cut into the center of the hill, and those he descended until he reached the stone chamber. It was dark in that tomb, dark as a tin mine, and Bod saw as the Dead Sea and the room gave up its secrets to him. The sleer was coiled around the wall of the barrow. He could feel it. It was as he remembered it, an invisible thing, all smoky tendrils and hate and greed. This time, however, he was not afraid of it. Sear us, whispered the sleer, for we guard the things precious and never lost. I don't fear you, said Bod. Remember, and I need to take something away from here. Nothing ever leaves, came the reply from the coiled thing in the darkness. The knife, the brooch, the goblet, the sleer guards them in the darkness. We wait. Pardon me for asking, said Bod, but was this your grave? Master sets us here on the plain to guard, buries our skulls beneath this stone. "'Leaves us here knowing what we have to do. "'We guard the treasure until Master comes back. "'I expect he has forgotten all about you,' pointed out Bod. "'I'm sure he's been dead for ages himself. "'We are the Sleer. We guard.' "'Bod wondered just how long ago you had to go back "'before the deepest tomb inside the hill was on a plain, "'and he knew it must have been an extremely long time ago.' He could feel the sleer winding its waves of fear around him, like the tendrils of some carnivorous plant. He was beginning to feel cold and slow, as if he'd been bitten in the heart by some arctic viper, and it was starting to pump its icy venom through his body. He took a step forward, so he was standing against the stone stone slab, and he reached down and closed his fingers around the coldness of the brooch. Hish! whispered the sleer. We guard that for the master. He won't mind, said Bod. He took a step backward, walking towards the stone steps, avoiding the desiccated remains of people and animals on the floor. The sleer writhed angrily, twining around the tiny chamber like ghost smoke. Then it slowed. It comes back, said the sleer in its tangled triple voice. Always comes back. Bod went up the stone steps inside the hill as fast as he could. At one point he imagined that there was something coming after him, but when he broke out of the top into the Frobisher mausoleum and he could breathe the cool dawn air, nothing moved or followed. That's the end of part two of chapter four.